Thank you very much, Andy. <clears throat> He's not feeling well at this time. Ah. So, uh, oh, yes, uh, some sort of headache this morning, but praise the Lord. He was able to serve us, serve God today, and share the message of the music coming from the Lord. Last Sunday, church, we gave tribute to our fathers. We celebrated Father's Day, and today, we are also going to give tribute, but we're going to give, <clears throat> excuse me, tribute to our graduates and our achievers. Uh, we will hear message about life. We will hear message about achieving things for the glory of God. And this message is not only for our graduates and achievers, but to those who are following Jesus step by step, to those who have new chapters in their lives. I myself, I have turned a new chapter in my life. I am now in my late first century. Right? I know that some of you can uh, relate with this, and some of you have welcomed me very warmly uh, to this second phase part of my life. Uh, and some of you are still in the early first century. Enjoy it while it lasts, right? So, uh, today, church, um, we're going to hear a message about Jesus Christ and what He will say to our graduates and our achievers. What would Jesus say to our graduates and achievers? You know, when I was preparing for this, I really don't know what to say. You know, you know I would say, congratulations, job well done. But I think God, through Jesus Christ, has a lot of things to say for our graduates and for our achievers. Uh, and here is what we need to know today. Every life in this room will impact this world. You will impact this world. The big question is, what that impact will be? Will it be for the glory of God? Or will it be for a stumbling block or distraction for the people of God. And, and I, I submit to you that what we do in life echoes in eternity. There is no small or big things that we do in this life. Everything in, li in our lives today have eternal implications. It echoes throughout eternity. The, Jesus said you can either gather people into His kingdom or you will scatter people from His kingdom. And that is echoing out throughout eternity. You know, we just celebrated lives that we love in the first three or four months of this year. I know some of you uh, miss them a lot, right? And uh, we've seen lives of faith that have echoed even today and will echo throughout eternity. But, but today, church, uh, it's on our watch. It's our journey that we walk. It's our echo that we build in for all eternity. So, so I want to challenge you. Uh, in fact, I want to challenge us, including myself. How do we build a legacy that will give God glory all throughout eternity? Uh, there are two things, two things that God will say to us this afternoon. Two things that will allow us to echo God's glory throughout eternity. And the first thing is this. God will say to us, and this is the challenge for all of us that we will echo not only in this life, but will echo throughout eternity. God will say to us, I love you. I love you. We know the, the greatest verse in the Bible, the most famous one, right? John chapter 3, verse 16. And we memorize this verse, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have life everlasting. But God did not only say that. God did not only declare His love to us. In fact, He showed it to us. He demonstrated to us. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, uh, the Scripture tells us, but God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He proved this love by acts of sacrifice. And He so loved you that He was willing to take your sins on that cross. He, he was so willing to love you. And He did that unconditionally. Right? He demonstrated His love for us while we were still unlovable, while we were still sinners. Right? You know, when, when we're talking about graduation or being able to graduate, when we're talking about being able to achieve something, 
you know, we think it's, it's, a, it's a merit system, right? It's a merit system. And that's why, you know, we have to have really to understand the, un- the unconditional love of God. If I bring home good grades, right, I will get extra allowance from my mom. Is that correct? You know, for me, if I'm, if I'm working, for example, and I do, you know, if I do some good job in my, uh, good, good things in my job, in my workplace, I get extra allowance from my wife, right? But, but Jesus loved me even though I was still unlovable. That's the, the demonstration of His love. He even loved me even when I didn't love Him. And that's how much God loves us. That's how much God loves you. Uh, don't you dare question if God loves you. And He showed it to us 2,000 years ago while we were still sinners. He died for us. And, and this is what we need to echo throughout eternity in our lives. Right? We need to echo the love of God in our lives. What would Jesus say to our graduates and achievers? That God loves you. I love you. And the challenge is every day of our lives we need, we must echo this love of God in our lives. The second church is this, and I would like to spend more time here. I think this is fitting just so that we can really appreciate what God is doing in our lives, right? The second thing, God will say to us, I have a plan in your life. First thing is, I love you, and I have a plan in your life. A very unique plan. A very specific plan in each one of us. There is no two people or two persons that have identical plan of God in their lives, right? We have a specific plan, God has a specific plan, God has a unique plan in our lives. And one of the more famous verses when we talk about the plan of God in our lives, I'm sure we, we know this and we hear about this, is in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Let me use this verse this afternoon, but allow me also to, to continue with verses 12 and 13. And I think this is where the, uh, the importance of understanding the plan of God in our lives lie. In verse 11, the scripture tells us, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Oh, what, what better picture is this church, right? For, for the graduates that we have, for the achievers that we have this afternoon, that God indeed has planned for us. And it is not to harm us. But it is for our welfare. It's not for our calamity. It is to give us hope. It is to give us a future. For one reason or another, you know, this afternoon, the plan of God in our lives is for all of us, our schedule to coincide with one another, for all of us to be here this time, here, sitting here, me standing up here, right? Isn't this the plan of God in our lives? If this is not the plan of God in our lives, then this will never ever happen. I just saw Matthew come in. The plan of God in his life is for him to be able to listen to my sermon this afternoon, right? And nothing can, can, can prevent that from happening because that is the plan of God in our lives. I believe this is a miracle for all of us in our schedule, in our busy schedule. You know, there would have been probably a thousand things that would prohibit us from being here this afternoon, but all of us are here in this one place at this particular time because it is the plan of God in our lives. Can I hear a big amen for that? Amen. Hallelujah, right? And we have a future. We have a hope because it is the plan of God in our lives. So how do you experience that future and how do you experience that hope? The scripture continues in Jeremiah chapter 29. And I would like to us to focus on this because we only stop in verse 11. Ah, the Lord has planned for me, declares the Lord. Plans to give me hope in a future, but there is Verses 12 and 13 to allow us to understand how that plan of God will be a reality in us. How we can embrace the future. How we can avail of the hope that God is giving us. Verse 12, the scripture is telling us, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to to you. The scripture tells us. Yeah, you can do it on your own. If you have a plan in your life, you can do it on your own, probably. Yeah, you can accomplish your own agenda for a while. And, and you probably can get what you build for a little time. But 
For me, I'd rather call on to God. I'd rather ask God who can give me my hope and who can give me my future because God declares that He has a plan for me. And the will of God in our lives, church, centers on our relationship with Him. Look at verse 13, right? So if He has a plan in our lives, He asks us to call on Him, what verse 12 is telling us, but look at verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. God said there is a future. God said there is a hope that is only found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, in a personal relationship with God, when you seek Him with all our hearts. And that is the plan of God in our lives. You know, sometimes we think that God's plan in our lives is totally separate from our relationship with Him. Oh, the plan of God in my life is for me to be a successful businessman. Yeah, that's the plan of God in your life. But for you to be a, a successful businessman, you need to have a special relationship with God. You need to ask God in verse 12, you call upon me, you need to come to me, and I will listen to you. And in verse 13, you will need to seek me, and you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, the enemy wants to rob us of God's plan. You know, when we have doubts, when we have challenges, you know, we, we pursue a dream, we pursue a goal, we pursue an objective, and along the way, you know, we stumble. Along the way, we have challenges because the enemy is there attacking and he wants, us, wants to rob us from the plan of God, not only for the graduates, but every one of us in, in our venture in our endeavor in this life, the enemy is always there. But here's the good news. Here's the comforting thing. Yeah, God has a plan for us. He gives us a hope and a future, and He will make it sure to complete it. Right? When you place your life, your future, your hope in the hands of the Almighty God, He will complete your future and your hope. In the writings of Paul to the Christians in Philippi chapter 1, verse 6, we have this famous verse that says, tells us, for I am confident, Paul is telling us, of this very thing. Right? That he who began a good work in you will perfect it. Right? That until the day of Christ Jesus. Right? That means God will complete it. That it will become a, a, a reality. It will come to completion. You don't have to sweat it. You just need to submit your future to God. But how does he do that? How does he complete us? You know, I... I have this case study that I would like to present to you as God would allow us very quickly on how we can submit our future to God. And the best example I can find is, is one biblical character, one of the more famous biblical characters in the Bible by the name of King David. And the premise of this is found in his writings in the Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter 78, verse 72. And look what he told us. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them with his skillful hands. So there are two things here, church. Right? When we are trying to, to seek the hope and the future that God would give us, every actions that we do echoes in eternity. But God is the one allowing us to achieve that. In verse 78 or 72 of chapter 78, David himself tells us, it is with the integrity of his heart and it is with the skill of his hands. And what, and what we mean by this, right? Uh, what is it about David that is so special if he is our case study? And let, let me submit this to you. First and foremost, what God did in the life of David, and not only our graduates and not only our achievers can learn from this, can glean from this, but all of us today, including myself, right? God developed David's heart. That is the first and primary thing that God did to David. God gave David a shepherd's heart. Uh, here's a deal about a shepherd's heart. Right? David learned while he was tending his sheep, tending his flock, at the onset, at the very first part when he became a shepherd. He understood right off the bat that with a bunch of sheep, right, that it... It is not about him. It is about the sheep. If he has a shepherd heart, it is not about the shepherd. It is about the sheep. 
he learned as a shepherd that it is pouring his life for the benefit of his sheep. So for us, if we want God to develop our heart and for us to achieve great and wonderful things as God would plan us, it is not about us. It is about having a shepherd heart, meaning it is about others. It is about the sheep. That those sheep did not exist for him. David existed to take care of those sheep. A shepherd's heart. He learned to have a servant's heart. He was a servant of God, right? That's why he was called the man after God's own heart, right? He showed up as a little shepherd boy. You know, being a shepherd, you would think, ah, Pastor, we're, we're giving tribute to, to great achievements today, right? Uh, graduates, you know, I'm college, high school, achievements. Magna cum laude, summa cum laude, and you're talking about being a shepherd. Uh, being a shepherd, it seemed a simple task. A task that David took very seriously. And, and I am convinced, church, that if David didn't take seriously the simple task of being a shepherd, we would not have known David to be the mighty king of Israel. Would you submit? And would you believe that, church? Right? You know, do, do you have chores growing up? You know, I grew up, I know my mom is here, right? but I grew up um, in the age of chores. Yeah. We have chores. Maybe it's far enough for the kids growing up here. I have an older brother, and ha- I have a younger sister and, and a younger brother. But the younger sister and younger brother, they were so blessed because they have two older brothers to do the chores for them, right? That's why I'm, I'm taking my revenge now with my youngest brother, right? <laughs> so my, my older brother, you met, some, you met him, you know, most of you. He's in charge of everything inside the house. You know, cleaning the room, right, dusting off the furnitures. I am in charge of everything outside the house, making sure that the backyard is clean, making sure that the plants are being watered, making sure that the garbage are being thrown out. So those are the years of the chores. Can, can most of us relate to that? I know my older generations, you have a harder chore than, than our generation, but the kids right now, you know, chore is spelled C-H-O-R-E, if you don't know, right? Or chores, right? <laughs> you know, maybe... David, maybe in, in his days, he get up early in the morning and he would say, Praise God! You know, I need to milk the cow today, right? Do you do that when you're doing the chores or you grumpily do your chores every day? You know, I got to take the trash today. Nobody embraces the chores, right? But you know what? David did. David embraced it with bigger passion. Because he believes that wherever he is, in his point, at the very point in his life, whether he was a shepherd at that point in time, when it, you know, in his teenage year, he, he made sure that God is the center, that he is in the center of God's will, whatever it takes. Right? That's what made David a giant killer. Right? See, see, David didn't under, underestimate the small things. In the life of David, what seems so insignificant, what seems so small, what seems to be the lowliest of tasks, what we find is that those insignificant small things actually add up to the significant big things. That if we miss even the value of small things, we will never see the value of of big things. It always starts small. And you need to have the right attitude when you're doing the small things. And David did as a shepherd boy. Never in the life of David that he was not passionate about being a shepherd, tending the sheep. It was during this period of insignificant time that God will develop a giant killer. That God will develop The greatest king Israel have ever seen during that time, right? It was during the time he was taking care of the sheep. Uh, If you know that the terrain of the Middle East during that time, it was so hot, right? Would you agree? So hot. If I'm the one shepherding those sheep, I would find the biggest shade and I would find the coldest brook. And every day I would bring my sheep there. 
right? And just probably whistling every day, right? Because I don't want the spanking, right? I need to do my chores. Right? But not David. Not David. David showed up to work, and he was ready. He came with a slingshot, right? And he came with the heart of God and a heart for God's task. It was in that field that God developed his heart for God. Psalm 78, 72 says, So he shepherded them with the integrity of his heart. It was in the field that God gave him a heart of praise and worship. It was in that field that God developed his heart. Not only that God developed David's heart, God also developed David's skill. God also developed David's skill. You know, every little boy needs a rock or a stone in his hand. Throwing rocks. In the case of David, practicing his sling. Right? You know, David has a lot of time. You think he mastered the slingshot? You think he was accurate? Right? Yeah, he, he was not a boy who just stood there and just bit his tongue, uh, bit fingers, I mean to say. He was playing with his sling. Right? Making sure he is good at it. Every day. Every day he took these things very seriously. There he was out there. He was throwing rocks, right? Uh, and, and as he gets a little older and stronger, and he starts saying, you know what? If I am going to be the shepherd God wants me to be, right? I want to be ready. I need to be prepared. There are all kinds of enemies that will come against my flock, right? Every day he didn't sit under the tree, but every day he's working with that sling, he got better, and he got better, and he got better, and David was prepared. David was ready. He didn't blow off the elementary years. He didn't blow off the middle school years just to get by and pass with just you know, whatever grade he wanted, right? He excelled right? his high school years. He knows something has to be done. He sees the day everybody, you know, every time he can. His testimony, we, we read about how God showed up on his behalf. And it all started out in the field with his sheep. You see, David learned early in life the power of small things. He was faithful in the smallest duty, in the smallest detail that led him to be even greater in bigger things. You see, it's the small things being done well every day that leads to big things in the future. Let me repeat this, church, right? Very important. It's the small things being done well every day that leads to big things in the future. So many times we want to have God do something great in our lives. And we want to be part of something big, right? But we don't want to be as committed to the small thing. We want God to pour the big stuff, but the only way you will get to be and to do the big stuff is to be humble with the little stuff. Everyone wants to be a giant for the Lord, but very few people want to be a shepherd for the Lord. Everyone wants the glory of victory, but nobody wants the preparation time of God developing our hearts in the skill of our lives. David, David allowed God to do that. All he cared about was every single day, this is David, he shows up for God. Every single day, God will get the glory for his life for that day. He will give everything for God to be at the center of God's will because that's the plan of God in his life. So it wasn't his idea. It was God's idea when David finally meets his giant. And I tell you, church, we will all meet our giant. Would you agree? Giant, gianter, giantess. Right? We will all meet our giants in our lives. And David met his giant. But David understood it was not David's strength. Right? God didn't raise up another Samson. He raised up a little shepherd boy. When you look at Samson, 
you can see his strength. Yeah. So you would probably see, well, Samson can probably take Goliath, right? But when you see David, all you see is a little shepherd boy. Nobody could believe it. It wasn't David's plan. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, I have plans for you. It was God's plan. It was God's strength. And it wasn't overnight he became a giant killer. It was day after day. It was, it was a daily walk. As he grew in his heart and as he grew in his skill, God continued to give him greater victory for the glory of God. I want you to think about David's timeline for a moment. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, this is a, about prophet Samuel, and in, in 1 Kings chapter 2, you will find out that David was about, he was about 30 years old when he became a king. But he was anointed king 15 years earlier. Right? Remember the story about Samuel coming to Jesse's household, right? And asking, you know, Saul is not working out, you know, because the Israelites, they, they took matters in their own hands. They, they thought that they can, they can raise up a king themselves. So they found the, the, the tall, tallest, darkest, and handsomest, and they found Saul. But we knew what happened to the Israelites, right? So when David was anointed, he was about 15 years old. David becomes king. He's anointed at age of 15. And God has a call in his life. And God has a plan in his life. And God revealed his plan in his life when he was 15. But he did not see it until 15 years later. So meanwhile, what do you think did David do? He continued to be a shepherd. He continued to serve Saul. Can you imagine that? You know, if you know God's will, there's, there's two sides of of God's plan in our lives. You know, the heads probably is the actual will of God. So in David's case, it is him becoming an anointing to become king of Israel. But there's also the tail side, the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is God's timing. Right? You, you have God's will and you have God's timing. Maybe for the most of us, when we know the plan of God in our lives, we would say, I want it now. Right? Everybody wants to be a giant killer, but nobody wants to be a shepherd. You know what David did after he was anointed to become king? He went back and he became a shepherd again. What's on the other side of the coin, the tail side? You have God's timing. We love God's will. I'm not sure we enjoy God's timing. So what do you mean, I have to go back to the sheep? David said, I want to go to the palace, right? What do you mean, I have to minister to Saul? You know, that dude is like demon-possessed. I should be taking his place. Right? But we saw David. David's, after God's own heart, went back and he became a, his shepherd. And he ministered to Saul. You know, God's will is that we bring glory to God in all things every day we live. For our graduates right, and achievers, uh, this is a great reminder for all of us. As we, as we bask in, in the achievements that we have, which is a blessing from God, we should always be reminded that God's will is that in our lives is to bring glory to Him in all things and every day that we live in this world. And, and God is more interested in making our lives holy than He is making our life happy. Right? You see, God's timing is about a daily faith journey. And, and who you are today, listen to this church, and where you are today, who you are, where you are today, it is the result of what you did yesterday, the day before yesterday, the year before, the decade before, and however long you've been breathing, right? Today, you are who you are, which is the accumulation of all the choices, accumulation of all the decisions you made, and what God has done in your life day after day. You are who you are because of yesterday. But, church, 
You are who you will be tomorrow because of what you will do today. Uh, let me show you very quickly. You know, in the timeline in the life of David, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, being David our case study here, right? documenting how David became a giant killer, how he became a king. We find David in 1 uh, Samuel chapter 17, starting with verse 12, we find here that David was simply a son of a man named Jesse. He has seven other brothers. In verse 16, it says here, during that time, the Philistines or Philistines arose against Israel and there was this giant named Goliath who was taunting Israel, the Israelites for, the, for 40 days now, right? And what happened was David was being asked to be an errand boy to go to his brothers to bring food. Remember the story? You know, here you are, you're the youngest, you know that you're the anointed king and your brothers are, are fighting the Philistines' army and, and you are there tending your father's sheep, right? Pra practicing your slingshot and now you have been tasked to bring food only, not to fight to your brothers, right? And you would say, ha, ah, why? But look at verse 20 in 1 Samuel chapter 17. You would think that probably David would slip in, probably David would take the day easy because it's like a boring task bringing food to his brothers but scripture tells us David woke up and he went early in the morning he didn't sleep in he didn't wait for the noon alarm clock to went off he got up early why did he get up? did he get up early he was passionate to do the right thing because he knew that that, that was the plan of God in his life he wants to give glory to God every day, even in small things, because he knew the power of small things. And look at what he did next. Not only did he go running out, but he was still a man of responsibility. He left the flock with a keeper. He took the supplies and he went as Jesse had commanded. What was it with David that made him so special? He understood the importance of doing the small things and doing it for the glory of God. Even if he feels he didn't like it, and even if he didn't want to do it. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. The power of small things tells us, He who is faithful in a very little thing is also faithful also in as much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. In that teaching, Jesus continued that those, that those I will trust my kingdom to, right? the bigger things, I'll give it to those who are faithful in the smallest things. So in verse 32, we find David coming to the front of the line. He met his brothers and he heard Goliath taunting his God. Right? He showed up and he saw the giant mocking God's people. And David said, what are you doing? How, how can you stand this? Right? And you know what David told Saul? David said, King Saul, listen to your servant. You know, while I was watching my father's sheep, a lion came by. Right? And God delivered the lion into my hand. A bear came by, and God delivered the bear in my hand. So you know David, right? He was really an expert with his slingshot, with his sling. He killed the lion. The story said, with his hand. He killed the bear. Goliath now, you know, from small things, maybe lion, maybe bear. And you know Goliath, right? A bigger target. That's no problem with David because he knew that it was not about him. He knew that it was about God. No problem, right? Because he understood it would be not his strength anyway. It will be the power of God right? working through him. He understood that it will be God through his servant who killed the lion. It was God who killed the bear. It would be God that will give him the giant. So David was not unprepared. All throughout his life, he was a slingshot expert. So now he just saw Goliath, a bigger target. No problem. Every day in his life, he was practicing the sling, his sling. 
as a shepherd boy, understanding the power of small things so that he can become the giant killer. And when he became the giant killer, he became the king of Israel. David will accomplish big things because he accomplished small things. For our graduates, for our achievers, well done. Right? Maybe this is, these are milestones in our lives, right? But we will find ourselves not always achieving. We will not find ourselves doing the greatest thing in, in, in our lives. We might find ourselves doing the mundane things, right? But there is always power in the small things. Each one of you, as you do your task at home and for this church, the small things, the small things, they are very important. And each action you do has eternal implications. Your eternal echo is made every day, decision by decision, moment by moment, step by step. It doesn't matter whether it's going and visiting the sick. It doesn't matter whether it's picking up, you know, trash after our worship celebration. Right? David spent most of his teenage life and young adult life tending sheep. Right? But it is in those years that God developed his heart. It was those years that God developed His skills. Maybe this is the first time we have heard about the plan of God in our lives. But God has a great plan in your life. The first thing He did was He allowed you to be here today. To understand the power of small things. That it is in the small things that we can become a giant killer in our lives. So today, church, I ask you, right? you don't need to sweat your life. You just need to submit your plan, your heart, your life to God. And His promise, right? He will give you a hope in a future. So if you're here, you're not here by chance, right? If you want to come up front and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, to always submit to His will so that you can be always in the center of the glory of God. Every day of your life, you give glory to God. Come up here and, and receive Him. If you've been a, a baptized believer and you want to be part of this church, and maybe your echo, your echo is in low volume, and, and you want to say, you know, Pastor, I now understand the power of small things. You know, this is where God planted me, and I will do every morning. I will shout. I will do the chores that God will give me for the glory of God. Come up front, right? And we will welcome you also. If you have a, a prayer request, prayer petition or thanksgiving, today God is here with us, right? He said, call upon me. Come to me and I will listen to you. Seek me with all your heart and you will find me. Let's all stand up church, right? Let's give glory to God. Today is a day of celebration. Today is a day of victory. You will all face the giants of your life. Be faithful on the small things so you will be ready when you face the giants of your life. God will develop a servant heart in us and God will develop our skillful hands so that we can face the giants of our lives. Let's sing this song, church. Let's give glory to God.